We've invited Erwan Michel Kerjan, who is the executive director of the Wharton Risk Center, to speak with us today about a new study by one of the world's foremost climate scientists, Jim Hansen, and his 16 co-authors, uh, most of whom are all of whom are also leading lights in, in the world of climate science. And we're, we're asking him to chat today about uh, what this uh, striking new study means uh, for planet Earth and also for business. Sure. Um, well, first of all, as, as we discussed before, that hasn't been peer reviewed, which means that we still have to uh, see what the community will, will, will think about their assumptions. These are models, so there will be assumptions behind the models, but clearly they want to uh, uh, trigger a big signal uh, toward the international communities. I think what, what's interesting to me is that we typically refer to the IPCC as uh, almost the benchmark today, while in reality the IPCC is a consensus document, so a very large number of scientists agreeing on what number, so we basically will select the lowest denominator and um, and great experience with the IPCC, except that, yes, uh, we have to make assumptions on things we don't consider. A very different setting here. Anson used to be the uh, chief uh, climate scientist at NASA. Most of the uh, co-authors are uh, top people in the field. Um, you know, there are many top people, but they are among these groups from the U.S., from uh, Europe, from China. So that's an interesting um, coalition of authors right here. I think for many years we thought we had the luxury to believe that well, we're facing a linear threat. So basically next year would be a little bit worse than last year, but only on the margin. And let's be honest about the discussion about climate. It's often pushing the discussion in 2100, not really telling the people what it means for me tomorrow or for my kids tomorrow. Uh, what Ensign is going to do now is, well, first of all, we don't have much time. They're talking about 2050. So it's literally almost tomorrow. And two, we're not talking about increase of sea level by a few feet. We're talking about large, large number, uh, five, 10, 20 meters. So basically two, three, four, five floor. <laughs> so it's, it's a very, I mean, if that's true, that's a radical change in the way we think about the impact of climate change. Now, the, uh, I just want to mention the IPCC is the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. I think they have a big meeting in September, and I believe that uh, Hansen has been quoted as saying they wanted to get this study out. The reason they didn't wait for a peer review, which would take months and months, is that they wanted to get this out in time for this IPCC meeting. Uh, I believe this is correct in, in September, so I just, just yeah, point that out. Yeah, yeah, and to their, I mean, just for people to understand, uh, it's typically peer reviewed before and then published, but the way that journal works is the way it works. So publish first, then you invite the entire scientific committee to comment, and that becomes peer reviewed by a large number of people. So it's not negative that hasn't been peer reviewed, right. uh, and it's not an excuse to tell that they're right or wrong. Um, so that's just to, to keep it. And going. that journal is the Atmospheric Chemistry and Physics Discussion Journal. So it is literally a journal for discussion. So yeah, it's different exactly. than a peer reviewed. Yeah. Okay, very good. So, uh, so potentially a big change, a geometric change rather than a linear change is what's being talked about here. What does, obviously that means that coastal cities like New York City could be in big trouble. We've heard talk about other, so many coastal cities, uh, if people have to migrate inland and if it happened very quickly, there could create great conflict. So we'd like to hear a little bit about that, but then also from the business side, this could change how companies pay for insurance, who maybe you can't get insurance, nothing immediate, of course, but it sounds like if the evidence for this starts to, to turn up o over the next couple of years, that it's, it will be getting taken even more seriously. So Yeah, well, if you take the United States of our example here, about 40% of our population live in uh, coastal areas. So it's not just New York or Miami. Mm -hmm. It's a large <laughs> number of people <laughs> affected here. So you can think about a real estate implication. You know, your apartment or your house used to worth five hundred thousand dollars. Now, no one wants to buy it. So I mean, the, the implication could be massive. Uh, insurance companies are obviously looking at this type of analysis very carefully, because what is insurable today may not be insurable tomorrow, or if it's still insurable, would be insurable at double the price or triple the price, depending on what the risk is. Uh, I think the big discovery again is it's that tipping point almost the fact that. Uh, we may wake up one day, it's not one day, but we can wake up in 20, 
2025, 2030, and in a matter of two or three years, see rapid sea level. And that's what people have been, um, have been fearing for years because you don't have the time to adapt. If you have 50 years, 100 years, if you're the, the chairman of the board, you can talk to your board of directors saying, well, this is a new environment that our firm will have to live in in 20 years from now. What do we do about it? That's fine. If you move for 20 years to the next five years, that's a radically different discussion. And just to be clear, um, roughly about the science, you can help me with this, please, but my understanding is that there are these huge ice shelves on land that move towards the sea, and particularly Greenland and Antarctica, or Antarctica and that they're melting, uh, first of all, maybe they shouldn't be melting at all, but they're not only are they melting, but they're melting at a rapid pace. That's fresh water going into the ocean. That changes the salinity. It changes the hot and cold levels of the ocean. Oddly, it can cause the ocean temperature to rise, but then somehow warmer water can get stuck under the ice in Antarctica, which actually causes it to melt fast. It's very complicated, but things are really melting, <laughs> even though they may get, it may seem like they're getting colder at first. Yeah. Uh, no, I mean, it's complicated, and that's part of the difficulty to communicate about it, because uh, very clear, quickly people get overwhelmed with the information. And the reason it's complicated is that you're talking about planet Earth. Uh, multiple interrelated systems, uh, air, water, soil, uh, sun. Feedback uh, loops. Feedback or? loops. Uh, but no, you describe uh, that pretty well. Basically, it's like you take a, a piece of ice and you put it in your glass of water, you let it melt, nothing happened. Your glass stay at the same level. Now, if you take your piece of ice and let it melt on the plate, you see water. And that's exactly what we're talking about. That, that ice is actually above sea level, which means that it's additional water coming in. Mm -hmm. That's one aspect. That's the sea level. Mm -hmm. And Antarctica and Greenland are by far the largest uh, resource for ice around the world. So when the ice starts melting, you have sea level rise. That's one. Two, you have less reverberation from the solar system. So basically, the planet Earth is going to absorb much more uh, eat than before. Not as much ice reflecting the, exactly. the light and heat back out into the Correct. atmosphere. So that's for the two part. And then you're starting to challenge the ocean systems in a way that we don't know how they're going to react. And I think that the issue here, uh, and I think that's what they discuss in the paper too, saying, well, we're not, we don't know for sure, but it's totally plausible that we'll have that um, rapid ice melting. That's what they're referring to. So we do want to see what happens when, when it becomes more peer-reviewed or when more scientists have a chance to look at the data. But this does seem like a step change uh, in, in prediction uh, compared with what we've seen in the past from top people. And um, is, is there a way to sum up what this study means or how important it is? Sure. Well, I think it's fair to say that other people have predicted that before. They're not the first one or the only one, except that you know, as time passes, we have more information that's being collected. The technology is more advanced as well, so we're in a better position to actually validate certain theories than we were maybe 10 or 15 years ago. And, uh, and planet Earth is already changing. I mean, that's a big thing. We don't have another 200 years to see change. It's already happening as we speak. So uh, more drought. I mean, look at the situation in California. I mean, you can take anecdotes here and there. When you take them all together and start looking at the system, the planet system, uh, planet Earth is already starting to fight back. So um, and the question for businesses to me is two for One is, what does that mean for my current business model, like kind of risk management, asset protection? Two is, uh, on the value creation side, if that is the world we're going to live in in the next 20 or 30 years, what type of new products, new services, uh, new intellectual property should we develop between now and then to be leading in a world with much more uh, which higher sea level. Um, so that's, that's an interesting. In the history of forecasting or predictions of climate change, you point out there's, there's been many. Um, the IPCC has made many of their so-called consensus predictions. How have they fared in, um, over the last 10, 15, 20 years when they predict something, how accurate has it turned out to be? Because as you say, we have more evidence, better technology for collecting evidence today. No, that's a great question. And the answer is um, not the one that a scientist would like to see, <laughs> but the reality is if you go back at uh, the very beginning of the IPCC, 
and you look at the prediction back then. Um, what year might that be? Uh, 15 years ago, let's okay. say. And mm -hmm. you look at what they predicted for 2020. So mm -hmm. uh, in terms of greenhouse gas emission, in terms of impact on the planet, uh, the worst case scenario is already happening. And I think that's important for people to realize that we have more data, but we thought, I think it's fair to say we, the international community thought we had more time. Mm -hmm. It will take much longer for planet Earth to react. Mm -hmm. And what we're discovering year after year is that we don't have much time actually. Mm -hmm. uh, planet Earth is starting to react much quicker than we had thought it would. And that new paper should potentially uh, not only much quicker, but much more intensely as well.